You know, I didn't understand it, so if you want to explain it, it'd be great. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming to uh, this version of the uh, UCLA Ethics Center lecture series. Uh, this is a special lecture uh, because it is, it is the genetics ethics lecture uh, sponsored by uh, Tom Weinberger and Leslie Vermoot. And it is a, it's one of the few conferences. You can't hear? I could hear. Can you hear now? All right, I'll use this. This is one of the few conferences where uh, UCLA and Cedars Ethics comes together, and it is only... It is only because of the efforts of um, Tom and Leslie um, that we have been doing this actually uh, year after year since 2006. In fact, I was looking back at the uh, dignitaries that have come, and uh, not long after they come, suddenly I start seeing papers by them everywhere. 
Um, Clayton, Bodkin, Jungst, Greeley, Knoppers, Cook, Deegan, uh, Murray. And today we are really lucky uh, to be able to uh, have Jay Olshansky uh, come to talk with us. Um, he's a really interesting fellow, and the more one reads of his work, uh, the more intrigued one becomes. Um, he's a PhD in sociology from the University of, uh, his PhD is uh, in sociology from the University of Chicago back uh, in 1984, and he's currently professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and also works at the Center for Aging at the University of Chicago and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, he thinks about how humans age, uh, what the biological limits of aging are, what the math mathematical models might be, and what the implications of aging uh, might be. Uh, one of the things that uh, he has been working on is the biodemographic paradigm of mortality. And I'll just read that it's an effort to understand the biological nature of the survival and dying out of processes of living organisms. Um, it has enormous implications for ethics um, because uh, anyone who's ever come to ethics consults or participated in any of our ethics committee meetings knows that it's always at the extremes of life. Um, that's where these ethical uh, issues arise. Um, so please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Olshansky for the Genetics Ethics Lecture 2014. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to break away from this because I'm a, a university professor, so you can't stand behind a podium when you're a university professor. I'll go back there to, to change slides. Um, first of all, I want to, want to thank you for inviting me out here. And actually, we were talking just, just before I came up here about uh, some papers that my colleagues and I have uh, written, one of which was on the longevity of U.S. presidents which I discovered, by the way, was the only paper ever written on the longevity of U.S. presidents. It only, uh, between you and me, it only, it only took 72 hours to write. Um, it was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was just a two-page brief. Um, but if somebody asks me about the longevity of U.S. presidents, I, will, I know the answer um, on how long they live and how long they live relative to everyone else. I'm going to do something. Uh, well, first of all, I, I have a Ph.D. in sociology. I have to be honest, I don't really know anything about sociology. Um, I didn't like it when I was at the University of Chicago. Uh, so that, you had to go through a sociology program to be trained in demography and, and, uh, and population health. So that's, that was my training. Uh, if you ask me about Weber and Durkheim, I won't know anything about Weber and Durkheim. I'm going to talk about aging and longevity in this century. Uh, and... Uh, where we've come from, where we are now, and where we're going. And this issue of where we're going uh, is pretty important for a wide variety uh, of reasons because of the controversy about uh, how much longer we can push out the envelope of, of human survival, and there's a, a considerable amount of debate. Um, so these are some of the various topics that I, I have the potential to talk about today, but I only have one hour. Normally, if I talked about all of them, it should take me about three hours. And I guarantee you it would be fun for three hours, but uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. I am going to start out with basic biology. I have to start out every talk that I give with an understanding of why we live as long as we do. If you don't know the answer to this question, then nothing else makes sense. Uh, I'll be, be honest with you. So in every talk that I give, I start out with the biology. Uh, I may or may not address this issue of whether or not we can all live to 100. I'll give you the definitive answer now. The answer is no. It, it's not going to happen. Uh, forecasting about how we get into the future. Subgroup dynamics, what's the differences, what are the differences among us? Um, no, no, those aren't really highly ethical issues. Uh, a couple of the issues I want to get, uh, the most important one I'm going to get to that deals with uh, ethical issues is this one is the next longevity revolution, uh, where we're headed. And then I'm going to raise two other issues during my talk where I want to pick your brain. 
Uh, I want to get your feedback on this. So you have no idea that this was coming, the people that invited me, and that's a good thing. Um, but it's some new developments in genetic epidemiology and how we predict duration of life for individuals and its relationship to in insurance companies and employers, and it's, it's pretty hot stuff. Uh, and it's, it's fairly interesting. So let me, let me deal with this issue of biology uh, to begin with. So the language, um, the language that we use in, in uh, aging science to describe what happens to us with the passage of time, the biological changes in our body, the word that's used most often, and which is most appropriate, is senescence. Aging should be thought of as the passage of clock time. So all of us age at exactly the same rate according to clock time, but we don't age at the same rate in biological time. So you know this from going to your high school reunion, I probably don't actually need to say anything more than that. <laughs> uh, so, by the way, these are genetically identical twins. Uh, the one on the left has Alzheimer's disease. The one on the right does not. I'm pretty sure the one on the right colors her hair. Um, so you can influence artificially at least what you look like morphologically. Um, but clearly there is a very strong random or stochastic component to senescence, the rate at which we senesce. And I would argue that we could go through this room, and if, in theory, we could measure your rate of senescence, I could guarantee you some of you, for example, may have the genetic potential to live for 100, 110 years, maybe if you're lucky, may or may not be the right word for 120. Um, and then some of you have the genetic potential to make it only out to 40 or 50. And, um, and there's, right now, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, I'm sorry um, to say, but if the genetic potential is, is there for 30, 40, and 50, that's how long you will live. Uh, medical technology is capable of manufacturing some survival time, but for some individuals, uh, it's, there are going to be limits to how far you can push that envelope. So why do we live as long as we do? We, we actually know the answer to this question. There, you know, some, most questions we don't know the answer to. We have some, some ideas, but this one we actually do. So I, I, I put this picture up here, um, I, both of these pictures, because this is my family. So it's easy for me to point to them. Uh, and, and so this over here is my daughter. Uh, this is my wife. And this is her mother, who passed away a couple of years ago. And that is my grandson that was just born 10 weeks ago. So, so I can show you four generations. And this is uh, my dad. Uh, this picture was taken when he was 70. That was my son, and that was me just a couple of years ago. <laughs> now, this, is, uh, this was my dad at 95. Uh, he was on cruise control for a quarter century with regard to senescence. He looked better at 95 than he did at 70, and he really functioned as well at 95. Uh, as he did at 70. You could see what happened to me and my son <clears throat> during that time period. Um, so the question is, why are we transformed from that little baby to, to that woman over there on the right side over a prescribed time period? Why does it take 70, 80, 90 years? Why doesn't it take 150 years or 200 years? Or why aren't we just living for 30 years? We know the answer to this question. You will walk out of here knowing the answer to this question. And as it turns out, it's all based in basic evolution and an understanding of evolution biology. And I will, this is my favorite phrase from Theodius uh, Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. If you don't know evolution, and evolution should be taught uh, for anyone who is, who, who is in a, a program studying aging, if you don't know evolution, you are missing a big part of the picture. So you're gonna get a small dose of evolution biology uh, today. I'm going to keep it simple. I basically argue that humans are like incredibly efficient machines. That is not my car, but that's the car that I aspire to have. They're in, like incredibly efficient machines, all of which make it to the junkyard. And by the way, you said biodemography is, was an area that I work in. Biodemography is an effort to understand the biological forces that influence duration of life which is the timing that it takes to go from this highly efficient machine to the, to, this, to the junkyard. And it applies to not just humans, 
but to all sexually reproducing species. That was my dog, uh, Sophie. She lived for about 5,200 days. Applies to horses, mice, all sexually reproducing species. It's the same pattern that applies to all of them. So I'm not going to go into detail on these th evolutionary theories. I just want to show you the pictures and the names of the people involved. It began with Darwin, as you might imagine. Uh, but Sir Peter Medawar, in the middle part of the 20th century, developed the concept of mutation accumulation, where he basically argued we accumulate uh, genetic mutations uh, with the passage of time. George Williams argued for the concept of antagonistic pleiotropy. Genes that do good things early do harmful things late. Fundamental trade-offs. And then Tom Kirkwood's concept of disposable soma. So I'm not going to go into detail on the evolutionary theories. I'm just going to show you a picture, which is going to illustrate the whole point. So I use the race car analogy to illustrate why it is that we live as long as we do. This is the Indianapolis 500 race, which takes place not far from where I live. Uh, in Chicago. So imagine when you engineer these automobiles, you want to make sure that, that they go for at least 500 miles because that's the length of the race. And you engineer the cars in a very specific way. And if you engineered them to only go one mile, you would engineer them differently. And in fact, you've seen those cars that go the very short distances with the big wheels on the back, back end. Those are engineered to go a different distance at a different speed. Well, if you operate those Indianapolis 500 cars uh, after the end of the race, because uh, what they normally do is they turn the engine off, right? Well, you can't do that with a living machine. Uh, but if you were to do that, if you were to continue to run these machines around the track until they all failed, you would actually see a distribution of failure times or death times for uh, these automobiles that would resemble that of humans and other living things. Some would die quickly. There would be some Methuselah cars out on the end, and there would be a distribution of failure times uh, between them. And you would get to see things go wrong with those cars that you ordinarily wouldn't have an opportunity to see because you're operating them beyond the end of the race. Well, if you, uh, if you drive a car, you know that you run into this same problem, which, by the way, is precisely why I lease car, all of my cars only for three years so I don't get to see things go wrong with them. Unfortunately, we can't do that with our bodies. And so uh, the, the concept, this concept of a race, applies to living things, to sexually reproducing species. So essentially, we make it to our reproductive years. We ensure the reproductive, we pass our genes on to the next generation by making it to parent, grandparenthood. We ensure the reproductive success of our offspring uh, by making it out to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, grandparenthood, which just hit me. I guess, I guess that means 10 weeks ago I became biologically obsolete which my daughter has been telling me has been the case for a long time. And what we did during the course of the 20th century is we pushed out the envelope of survival into the post-reproductive region of the lifespan where we get to see things go wrong with human bodies that we ordinarily wouldn't have an opportunity to see. So there are only a few species that you see this with. You see it with your, well, actually, you tell me. What, what other species would you see aging like we see in humans? Any ideas? Yes, right. Your dogs, your pets, right? What do we do with these pets? We bring them in and we protect them, just like we do to ourselves. Any, any other sets of animals that we would see this in? Laboratory animals, right? What do we do? We bring them in, we protect them. We insulate them from the hazards of the outside world. And then zoo animals. Those are really the only, only animals where you see aging, like you do in humans. And the irony is, is that you see the same kinds of things go wrong with these other animals that you do with humans. They begin to lose their, their senses, their sensory, experience sensory impairments, problems with their plumbing. Um, and I'll explain the plumbing issues in a minute. My, my dad happened to be a plumber, so I, I use that language often. So here's the, the basic concept in a nutshell. If you divide the duration of life, don't read the words, by the way. If you divide the duration of life into three regions, the pre-reproductive region between uh, conception and puberty, the reproductive region between puberty and menopause, and it's equivalent in men, and the post-reproductive region out here. Um, you basically get the, the concept of, of why it is that we live as long as we do. And my colleague and I, uh, my colleague Bruce Carnes and I, have documented 
that duration of life of humans and other sexually reproducing species is calibrated. I'm going to say this twice. It's calibrated to the onset and length of the reproductive window. So the distance between here and here determines how long we live as a species. And the same thing applies to other sexually reproducing species. Duration of life is calibrated to something that has nothing at all to do directly with aging. It's calibrated to reproduction. So species that go through puberty early and have short reproductive windows live short lives. Species that go through puberty late and have long reproductive windows live long lives. And this also applies within species, which means that, for example, women who go through natural menopause late should live significantly longer than women who go through natural menopause early. And we know this to be true from the study of centenarians and their offspring. So it applies within species as well. So a mouse goes through puberty at about 30 days. It lives about 1,000. A dog goes through puberty at nine months. It lives about 5,000 days. An elephant lives 26,000. Humans, these are remarkably accurate statistics, by the way. Human goes through puberty at about 11 years. We live about 29,000 days. A sea turtle goes through puberty at 50 years. Puberty at 50 years of age. They reproduce for a century. They live for over 150. And a bowhead whale, I actually don't know when bowhead whales go through puberty, but they can live for 210 years. It's a mammal, just like us. Almost just like us. So duration of life is calibrated to reproduction. Keep that in mind, because you have to realize what that means. Reproduction is a genetically fixed attribute of the species. Growth, development, reproduction, these are fixed genetic programs. We're not meddling with those programs anytime soon. Which means we are not going to see radical increases in life expectancy or lifespan unless we fiddle with some of these genetic programs that influence early life developmental events, which is another way of me saying it's not going to happen. So, so I just debated a friend of mine, Aubrey de Grey, the other day about duration of life who was arguing we're going to be immortal or, or live much, much longer, and I, I basically said nonsense. Uh, not in this world. So senescence is a uh, a byproduct of living beyond what I refer to as the biological warranty period for our, our bodies. That's conceptually, that's sort of, of how I think of it. So uh, keep in mind, so I've, I've been a run, I was a runner for many years, and um, I always, I tried to run a four minute mile in my younger days. I did not succeed. Um, and, but I don't have a genetic program in me that says, Jay, you can't run a four minute mile. But I couldn't run a four minute mile because of my body design. My body design wouldn't allow it. Now, back then, I was a lot skinnier. I will tell you, I put on a lot of weight after I had to stop running. Um, but even then, even when I was slimmer and I tried running fast, I couldn't run a four-minute mile. The absence of a genetic program isn't the reason why. It was basic body design that made it impossible for me to run a four-minute mile. And the same thing applies to duration of life. We don't have a gene. And we, don't have, or, and we don't have a set of genes that are designed to kill us. Aging de genes, death genes, cannot exist. They could not have evolved under the direct force of natural selection because the only way that could have happened is if selection was operating in the post-reproductive region of the lifespan, and that could not have been the case during the early origin of humans when very few people lived out to very old ages. So there can be no aging program. There can be no death program. Keep that in mind. I know people use the word aging or the phrase aging genes. That's a wrong phrase to use. There can be no aging genes. There may be genes that are associated with aging that protect you from certain diseases or maybe slow down the aging process. Keep in mind that those did not evolve under the direct force of natural selection. They could not have. All right. All right, so my colleagues and I, I have to show this only because it was so much um, fun. Uh, originally, I wasn't going to, but I, when you mentioned it er, uh, earlier, I, I figured I, I, I put it in here just in case somebody wanted to see it. So this was a paper that my colleagues and I published in 2001, and I can tell you a reprint is coming out. Scientific American is devoting a special issue to aging 
uh, in the spring of 2015, and this is going to be one, one of the papers. The title of which was, If Humans Were Built to Last, my colleague is Bruce Carnes from the University of Oklahoma, and the late Bob Butler, I don't know if any of you knew Bob, uh, he was the founding director of the National Institute on Aging, a wonderful man uh, who we were pleased to work with. And we basically did something. This is my favorite paper that I've ever published. You know how you have a favorite, favorite manuscript? This was mine by, by far. We decided that we were going to figure out what the human body would look like if it was designed better. Because remember, from an evolutionary perspective, there is no designer. Um, there is no intelligent designer. <laughs> Um, and in fact, if there was, we'd be designed a whole lot better than we are now because so many things go wrong with us uh, with the passage of time. So we asked the question, what would we look like if we, if we were designed with longer and healthier lives in mind? So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. We took a look at the changes that occur in our bodies with the passage of time. Uh, loss of muscle mass, loss of bone density, sensory impairments, um, Bipedal locomotion, you have to realize there's very few species that move around from point A to point B using bipedal locomotion, which is a, a disaster for your back. Uh, and by the way, I have spinal stenosis, which is why I had to stop running. Um, and so there's so many things that go wrong uh, with the body that we decided we were going to fix them one at a time. So we used a couple of examples of, of basic problems. We only had a limited number of images to work with in Scientific American, but one of the most bizarre contraptions that exists in the human body is this crossing of the food and the air passageway in the back of the throat, which really doesn't make much sense uh, when you think about it because we end up choking on our food and water, especially as we get older. Uh, and then, of course, the sensory impairments, loss of hearing, uh, loss of sight. These are all problems that occur with the passage of time. So we fix them. We... <laughs> We raised the trachea, it eliminated that problem, but um, there actually is another species, which we used a lot of other species as examples for how to do this. Uh, there's another species that has the equivalent of a raised trachea, which is a horse. A horse can breathe and drink at the same time. Now, we can't, but they can't speak uh, either. So a minor trade-off. Um, you'll recognize this ear because this ear was, we published this in 2001, this ear was stolen from us by Avatar. <laughs> in case you, when you go back and you watch that movie, they used our ear. So the, you can't tell from this, but the ear is mobile. So you could move it uh, from left to right. And then we increased the number and durability of the hair cells in the inner ear to make sure that they would last longer. For the eye... Up there, we use the attachment of the optic nerve uh, to the retina from a squid, which is a more stable connection than the one that we have, which wraps around. Um, so we, we like using other animals as examples. This is one of the worst examples of body design that could possibly exist. Who would think to run a tube carrying a liquid through uh, an organ that closes with the passage of time? Right, we know most men 50 years and older have either prostate cancer or some related uh, problem. Now, remember, my father was a plumber, right? So I would show him this picture, and i go, what do you think, Dad? And he'd go, well, that's the work of an apprentice. <laughs> you know, it does not make any sense. And ironically enough, he suffered from prostate cancer. He actually, he had, to have, he, had to, he had to be redirected when he was older because of this uh, very problem, which I presume is one of the reasons why he said this was a bad design. Um, so we fixed it. It's a pretty easy fix. Um, you pull out the tube. By the way, um, a couple of years ago, I had a kidney stone. Uh, so I'm, those of you who are in the audience that have had kidney stones, you know what I'm talking about. Why in heaven's name do we have nerves in here? At all, I have no clue, uh, and so I, it's possible that we might, in the next version of this paper that comes out in the spring, we might fix that by removing the nerve endings in this tube, because I, I don't understand why we need to have that pain, or why we need to know about it. 
Well, there it is. We pieced it all together, and this is what an anatomically more efficient human would look like. We uh, made the animal shorter. We tilted the upper torso forward to deal with issues with the lower back. We increased muscle mass, bone density. We reversed the knee joint. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this was my idea, I'll freely admit. And we did it for visual purposes only, just because we wanted something that would, wouldn't compute when you looked at it. Because you look at it and it's like, that doesn't make any sense. There are a few species that actually have what looks like a reverse knee joint. Um, and we increased the uh, number of check valves in the lower extremities. Remember, I'm from the Midwest, so we have basements. If you're not from the Midwest, um, a basement is that thing you walk down to in the lower end of your house. And there's water that accumulates in some places, and you have to get it out of there. So you put in what, something called a sump pump, which is essentially what, what we have uh, in our lower extremities. And we want to make sure that that liquid flows in one direction. So you have these check valves that essentially operate. It's like a giraffe has the very efficient check valves in its neck to ensure that blood is flowing uh, you know, towards the head very efficiently. So we increase the number of check valves that exist. And there were a number of stories that came out after that article was published. This one was in the Singapore, the Singapore Times. Um, you can tell by looking at the face on that one. And here's the male version of this picture. Um, so we were con I was contacted by a biomechanical engineer shortly after this paper was published. And the biomechanical engineer said, you know, Jay, if you tilt the upper torso forward 15 to 20 degrees, you reverse the knee joint, and you put a weight in this thing's hand, it's just going to fall right over. And he was right, of course. The message that we were trying to get across was not that we can design any better. We weren't making that case at all, although I will tell you that members of the religious right contacted us immediately after this paper was published, basically complaining that we were playing God. And we basically said, you don't get it. Uh, the point we're trying to make here is that the design that we have that we can't change wasn't intended for long-term use. It was intended for short-term use. And we use this body way beyond its biological warranty period. Don't be surprised when things go wrong. And, and I would point out, and this relates to the end, the uh, latter part of my talk on where we're headed in the future. My colleagues and I contend that we've put ourselves in a very precarious position in this modern era, where we're now going after heart disease, cancer, and stroke, the main things that kill us today. But what, what we're concerned about is the price of success. What happens if we succeed in extending the envelope of survival into outer regions of the lifespan. Very much like driving the automobile beyond uh, the end of the race, we push out the envelope of survival by lowering the risk of major fatal diseases, which we're trying very hard to do, and we will succeed, continue to succeed. We will, remember, death is a zero-sum game. You lower the risk of death from one thing, something else must rise, since death is inevitable. What are we going to get in return for a reduction in the risk of heart disease, cancer, and stroke? Alzheimer's, exactly, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease, uh, and other related uh, diseases and disorders that you would see in outer regions of the lifespan. So we have to recognize that these trade-offs exist uh, and be cognizant of the implications of, of doing so. So, um, you know, honestly, I think I have like seven messages, and I've only gotten through the first one, and I'm almost done. Um, so I'll cut to the, to the chase of some of these other issues in a moment. Uh, but you have to understand biology in order to get a complete picture of health and longevity, where, we, where we've come from, where we're headed. Uh, late natural menopause is linked to longer life. And, and a actually, the absence of aging and death programs is the good news. It's about the only good news I'm going to give you. Um, and the absence of those programs means that interventions can work. Diet and exercise can work to extend healthy life. Uh, other types of interventions, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, which have the potential to decelerate the rate of senescence, which I think are forthcoming, can work because we're not battling against the program, a genetic program designed to kill us. And that is the good news uh, in all of this. All right, I'm going to pass by this living to 100, although I will point out this ad. I just took this picture. Um, for those of you in the back who can't see it, 
It said thousands of people in Poland are over 100 years old. It ain't the yogurt. And that's a, a vodka advertisement. <laughs> So um, there, are, there are some insurance companies like Prudential, for example, up in the upper right-hand corner, who put this advertisement up there to scare people to save for retirement. And we basically said, nonsense. Um, it's not going to happen. We're not going to have people living out to 150. You don't need to say that. to pe- You don't need to lie to people in order to sell insurance. So they ended up removing those ads. But the Prudential ads that are out there now, which I'm sh- sure you've seen, uh, where they show if you save a little bit of money now, it'll pay off later. Those are actually brilliant. Uh, but they, re- they replace this one with the brilliant ads. We're not all going to live to 100. We're not going to push out the envelope of survival. Um, let me pass by this. Let me pass by all this stuff. Actually, I don't want to pass by this. This actually is a useful... I haven't published this yet, uh, but I'm close. All right. Uh, This is called the distribution of death. Uh, Let me explain uh, why this is relevant. If you took 100,000 babies born in a given time period and you apply to those babies the death rates observed in that year and you plot out the ages at which they would all die, you would get what's called the distribution of death. So the area under the curve is the same no matter what time you look at. So this green line here represents the U.S. population in 1900. What do you see? Extremely high infant, child, and maternal mortality right here. But then if you made it past the first couple of decades, you had a decent chance of living out into your 60s, 70s, and 80s. This is what the distribution of death looks like. The black line looks like for U.S. whites in the U.S. with 16-plus years of education. A rather dramatic transformation in a single century. What did we do? We brought down early age mortality. We pushed out the envelope of survival. We built what I would refer to as the mountain of mortality. This is where almost all deaths occur now in the United States and long-lived populations. Well, guess what? There is a subgroup in the U.S. living among us now that has a distribution of death that is roughly equivalent to what we saw 100 years ago. And this is for African Americans. The the Census Bureau uses the word blacks to describe uh, African Americans with less than 12 years of education. And what do you see? They have low infant, child, and maternal mortality. But once you get somewhere between the ages of about 25 to about 70, they die out at the same rate as the U.S. population 100 years ago. These are people who are here today with us. So life is not fair. There are great disparities that exist in a population today, and we see the same thing among the least educated whites in the U.S. In fact, we published a piece. You must have seen this. This one we published, I think it was two years ago. It made the front page of the New York Times, uh, documenting a drop in life expectancy of five years for the least educated white men and women in the United States over the last 18 years. That was a bigger drop than we saw from the 1918 influenza pandemic. And it lasted for 18 years, so it was huge uh, in terms of its impact on the population. All right, forget about that message. I'm going to pass by linear extrapolation. Oh, actually, I am not going to pass by this. So this is the distribution of death that I showed you earlier. But what I did was I created something called the red zone. I like using football analogies, too. So, And this is a particularly appropriate one for those of us from Chicago. When the Chicago Bears get inside the 20-yard line, they can't score a touchdown. So that's the red zone. It's just another way of describing compression. It sort of becomes more difficult to move things once you get into the red zone. And what have we done during the course of of the modern era? We've pushed out the envelope of survival into the red zone. I guess this would be the end zone, by the way. Now that I think of it, I'll have to, ch- I'll have to put that in the next picture. Um, so we push out the envelope of survival into the red zone where we get less and less in terms of an impact on longevity from efforts to reduce the risk of major fatal diseases. So if you, reduce the, if you, if you cured cancer, by the way, which uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we shouldn't try to cure cancer, 
But if we cured cancer, life expectancy for the U.S. population would rise by three and a half years. Only three and a half years. Now, I'd like to see it happen, but what would happen to this distribution? There would be a slight shift. The mountain of mortality would still be there, and the people saved from dying from cancer would live long enough to die from something else. So we would see a dramatic increase in Alzheimer's disease as a result. Let me pass by this, because I want to get to some controversial stuff. Right, I'm going to pass by this. Set. Although there's one picture in here I have to show you. This one. When we look at, at the timing with which death occurs in a population, you know, we, we tend to lump everyone together. Uh, we now realize that there are tremendous differences among us. We, we refer to it as subgroup dynamics, but it's basically another way of saying some people are destined to die early, destined, no matter how hard we try to save their lives. Some individuals are destined to die at middle ages, no matter how hard we try. You might recognize this gentleman, um, Jim Fix, for those of you who might be a little too young. Uh, he introduced running to the world. What, remember when that was? It was like the 1970s, something like that. He died in his 50s right after a run. I think he had hypercholesteremia. And then you get folks like this. <laughs> you know, the longest lived person in the world was a woman by the name of Jeanne Calmon, who lived for 122 years in southern France. She smoked for a century. So clearly smoking was not a risk factor for her. It's not a recommendation to smoke to live long, which is what some of my students, that's how they interpreted that. When I first said it, I said, no, 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 no. Um, it's not a recommendation to smoke. It's just a suggestion that for her, smoking was not a risk factor. Uh, what's that? Smoke cold water is not a heart secret. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let me pass by this. Oh, um, I won't, well, I'll just briefly mention this. A few years ago, in 2005, my colleagues and I published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine suggesting that this is the first generation of children that is going to live a shorter lifespan than their parents' generation. Now, we said that there was going to be a latent effect of the rise of obesity. Uh, this would be adult-onset obesity, and then childhood obesity would have its impact as these generations move through the age structure. So I'll freely admit we were wrong. We said it would take 10 years to begin to see the negative effects of the obesity epidemic. It took only five. Uh, it was a lot worse than we thought. Uh, and in fact, I think, I, I think I just put in a couple of these pictures on obesity trends from 1985. I probably didn't even include the latest one. This is prevalence by state. We essentially had an obesity epidemic, adult onset obesity epidemic, sweep across the country over the last couple of decades. And now the childhood obesity epidemic has already spread across the country. In fact, it's spread across the globe. And so the impact of this obesity epidemic on frailty and disability and then mortality is going to play itself out. And we predicted a couple of years ago in a paper, um, I think it was in the Annals of Internal Medicine, that uh, the canary in the coal mine has already died, and that there's a, an indication that we will see a rise in cardiovascular disease mortality within the next uh, decade or so as a result of obesity. <clears throat> so it's not like we don't know why. Look at the foods we eat. This happens to be um, a, a week's worth of food for a, a German family. You, you don't really need to see much more than the sort of the distribution of uh, fruits and vegetables versus everything else. Here's the typical American diet. There are some fruits and vegetables right over there. <laughs> it's not a surprise why this has happened. This is a week's worth of food in Italy, or Poland, rather. Mexico. Mexico is actually one of the more interesting cases because they had a rise in 
childhood obesity, that uh, the speed with which it occurred was faster than what we had in the U.S. It's a disaster. And you can actually see part of the reason in the upper uh, uh, image, upper part of the image, where you see uh, regular Coca-Cola um, as part of the normal diet. Italy. Egypt, so we moved to a, a plant-based diet, and you can see body, body mass is considerably different. And you notice the family sizes are also a lot larger, um, by the way. Bhutan. Ecuador. This is one of my favorite pictures, actually, because they're, they're all so happy. <laughs> all right. Let me get by education. We all know that education is good for you. Here, all right, so here is where I want to introduce you to two things. I realize I only have like 10 minutes left, right? Um, so here's where I want to pick your brain, and whoever, whoever it is that I meet with in the next hour, I want you to come back to me and tell me what you think of these issues. So my colleagues and I developed a technology. You can actually test it out yourself. You can go on the web, and you can go to a website called facemyage.com. Face, F-A-C-E-M-Y-A-G-E.com. You can upload a picture of yourself. It's free. And this technology will allow you to assess how old your face looks relative to everyone else your age. You may or may not want to know the answer. Um, and about half the population gets angry with us, and we don't really care. Um, if they get angry with us. It's, it's actually remarkably accurate. Now, the logic here is fairly straightforward. We know, as I indicated earlier, that the children of long-lived people tend to look younger than the children of shorter-lived people. So if you look at the offspring, if you look at the children of centenarians, I might have some of these pictures in here. I, I do. Um, some images uh, to illustrate. This picture, by the way, is the same woman. So here she is at 51. Here she is at 68. Um, she went through a period of accelerated senescence, which showed up in her face. And then you have these two guys down here, which, let me see if I have their picture. This is father and son. Can anybody tell me how old this guy is? What? 85. <laughs> Does he look 85? Yeah, no, no, the guy on the right. Yeah, no, no, I can see why you would say he would look 85. But um, I wouldn't expect him. I'm 60, but just so you know. Um, yeah, you're close. All right, so um, a colleague uh, of mine near Barzilai at Albert Einstein College studies the genetics of centenarians and their offspring. And this is a common feature that we see. If somebody tells you that you look young for your age, by the way, chances are, if, it, if, it hasn't been, if you haven't been augmented by surgery, or you know, I mean, maybe that's why they're telling you you look young for your age, but if you haven't been augmented in any way, chances are you're senescing more slowly. So remember, my dad made it to 96, my mom made it to 90. When I calculated my face age, I'm 60. My face age came in at 52, uh, which, which means if you, if you took a composite of my face and you compared it to the average 52-year-old in the United States, white male with 16-plus years of education, we would match perfectly. So I essentially look eight years younger than my chronological age. This is a longer story on, on, uh, on mortality risk. But what I can tell you is, is that insurance companies are probably going to be using this at some time in the future to uh, set your premiums. And so I want those of you who are going to be with me in the next hour to tell me whether you think this is a good idea or a bad idea, or even whether you think it's unethical in some ways. There are going to be a number of tests that come down the line within the next few years uh, some are already with us. This is basic genetic epidemiology, uh, where a simple blood test will allow you, allow us to assess with a reasonable degree of accuracy 
what your five-year survival is among healthy people. This isn't, this isn't for people who are sick. We're talking about assessing. Uh, this is a, a, an effective biomarker uh, for senescence. And I know biomarkers is sort of a dirty word among some people, but it's coming back as a way of assessing uh, survival risk. And then there's other tests that have come in on predicting Alzheimer's disease among healthy people. Uh, these tests are, are on their way. Uh, this one actually is already available. The, part of the problem here is that what, you can't do anything with the information uh, because we can't treat Alzheimer's disease. So th there's some questions as to whether or not any of these tests should even be made available. Now, I'm going to end with where we're headed in the future. And uh, what I refer to as the next longevity revolution. Now, there's, I'm going to give you two images of the next longevity revolution, one of which you're probably intimately familiar with because it's what you do here, and then the other one you probably are not intimately familiar with. So all of these changes, all of these interventions are either already here or they're on their way. And I would not uh, suggest that there, I would suggest that there's nothing we can do to stop it from happening. This one in particular, by the way, germline modification, perhaps scares me the most, uh, if for no other reason than it's evident that we really have no clue what we're doing. Uh, it's sort of like what we did with modifying certain plants and certain animals to achieve disease resistance or drought resistance, and there's almost always a negative trade-off when we try to manipulate an organism to favor one particular characteristic Basic evolution suggests negative trade-offs. Um, therapeutic cloning is on its way. Genetic engineering. These are all happening. They're all going to happen. I'm not going to say anything about whether I like it or not. It's on its way. Replacing and redesigning body parts. Well, you know, look, um, if you've got a, a bad knee, you've got a bad, bad hip, the technology is remarkable for enabling people to live healthier, longer lives with these technologies. So no one's complaining um, that these technologies have come online. They're wonderful technologies. I don't know why I had that one in there, because I don't really think it's, it's needed <laughs> for obvious reasons. We're going to get better and better at replacing organs. Ironically enough, uh, my I don't have a picture of a gallbladder up there, but... Um, there was a possibility that yesterday, I didn't, you didn't know this, but I might not have been able to come uh, because my daughter uh, was taken in for surgery this morning to have her gallbladder uh, removed, the one who just gave birth uh, 10 weeks ago. Uh, pretty remarkable surgery, uh, frankly, and they did it uh, fairly quickly. People who had these kinds of problems years ago would have died from uh, simple problems like this. Here's one of our Achilles heels. You know, you push out the envelope of survival, you have to make sure that you extend the functionality of both mind and body. Because when you get a mismatch between them, and we're working pretty hard to create a mismatch between mind and body making it out to older ages, survival is a disaster under those conditions. And I probably don't need to remind anyone about that. All of these advances in technology are going to happen. Personalized medicine is on its way. But let me point out one thing, and I'm going to end with this because I, I realize I only have, only have three minutes left. There is another revolution on its way. The one that I just talked about is focused on diseases. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, sensory impairments. It's the infectious disease model from a century ago applied to chronic, fatal, and disabling diseases. When something comes up, you throw medical technology at it. Your physician grabs your hand, takes you over the hurdle, and then he or she pushes you out the door to run the race of life until you face the next one. And then you go back to your doctor when the next problem arises. And these hurdles get, are getting closer and closer together in the red zone. I assume you're getting the imagery that I have, right, of these hurdles. Well, we've now suggested a number of researchers 
including researchers from, uh, from USC and probably UCLA, have now suggested that the time has arrived to create a new model of health promotion and disease prevention, one that's focused on delaying senescence itself. And many of us believe that it is not only possible. We published uh, this story, by the way, in the British Medical Journal in 2008. Uh, Bob Butler was the lead author of this one. And we wrote this one for, the, for physicians, by the way, in the BMJ. Um, and the basic argument is, is that aging, or a, the basic biological process of aging or senescence underlies all of the things that go wrong with us as we grow older. And what are we doing? We're putting band-aids on the consequences of senescence when, in fact, we can attack the biological process of aging itself. And researchers are fairly close to developing interventions that have the potential uh, to influence uh, duration of life. And you may have seen this story come out about a year ago about the creation of Google's Calico, which is designed to uh, attack senescence and we completely agree with this philosophy, uh, principally because they got the idea from other people who've been arguing uh, for this for a long time, but we completely agree with this philosophy that the time has arrived to go after aging itself as the primary way of extending uh, healthy life in the future. Uh, Craig Venter has done the same thing, and we agree with this line of reasoning as well. So there is a, 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 a level of momentum and excitement in the field now where many of us believe that the time has arrived for us to take this new approach to health promotion and disease prevention. Now, do we know exactly how we're going to get there? Do we know exactly what technology is going to be developed that will allow us to slow down the rate of aging? No. Just like President Kennedy didn't know in the early 60s how to send somebody to the moon, uh, even though he made the declaration that he wanted to do so. Uh, and other declarations similar to that have been made by others uh, in the past. We're basically saying aging is happening so rapidly that, and disease prevalence, especially uh, uh, disabling diseases, are rising so rapidly in this century that we need an intervention like this in order to extend the period of healthy life and avoid the infirmities that are associated with, uh, with old age. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this slide then because I realize I'm out of time. Uh, and I'm just going to point out that picture, by the way, up there is uh, Jeanne Calmon. That's the 122-year-old woman that smoked for 100 years. The study of the genetics of long-lived people may be one of the more promising areas that researchers can pursue. And the exciting part of this is it's, it's not a secret. We don't have to cross species. We can observe these folks now. I'm sure you've, you've seen some of these exceptionally vibrant and healthy centenarians, people who live past 100, and there's even a handful of vibrant and healthy super centenarians, people who live past 110. And understanding the genetics behind these long-lived individuals and how we can confer the protection that these individuals have onto the rest of us is where science is headed. And you can tell me what the ethical implications are of two things. One is if we succeed. And in my view, more importantly, what if we fail? What if we don't find a way to slow aging? And we continue to find the way to reduce the risk of heart disease, cancer, and stroke. So I would encourage you to raise these issues in the next hour with whoever it is that we're going to have this uh, discussion with because it's an interesting uh, topic for debate among those involved with basic issues of ethics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Olshansky, for, uh, for coming today. Um, we will convene upstairs in room 6234 for an hour of conversation and questions for Dr. Olshansky. I would like to uh, thank Leslie and Tom again for bringing Dr. Olshansky here today. And uh, I hope that everyone will join us upstairs in room 6234 within the Ronald Reagan Hospital. Thank you. Thanks.
<laughs> so we should take your mic off. Oh, uh, yes. We'll go upstairs. Did you get to eat? I did. I did. Okay. I ate lunch. I'm fine. Great. All right, let me grab this.